Good morning. Welcome, people in the room. Welcome to everybody online. My name is Sandra Galea, and I have the privilege of serving as Dean of the Boston University School of Public Health. On behalf of our school, welcome to this public health conversation. These events are meant as spaces for us to come together to discuss the issues that matter most for health. We are guided by expert speakers towards a deeper understanding of these core topics. Through a process of conversation and debate, we aspire to advance the ideas that shape a healthier world. Thank you to the many who work to make these events happen. Thank you to our co-hosts, the Boston University Initiative on Cities. Thank you to the intellectual architect of today's event, Professor Patricia Fabian. And thank you to the Dean's Office and Marketing and Communications team, without whose work, none of these events would take place. Today, we're going to discuss how we can shape a healthier future by designing resilient, healthy cities. More than half the world's population lives in urban spaces. In this country, about 80% of the population lives in cities. As the world urbanizes, the design of cities will have a significant influence on the health of populations. Shaping a healthier future means creating cities that are sustainable, inclusive, and broadly distributive of the resources that support health. Resources like housing, transportation, and clean, safe neighborhoods. We are delighted today to be joined by speakers who will lead a discussion of how we can place health at the heart of urban planning to build healthier urban communities. Today's event is divided into two sessions. In the morning, our theme is planning better cities. How do we build the healthy city of the future? After lunch, we will reconvene to engage with the theme of session two, safer cities. How do cities become better and more equitable environments in which to live? It's now my pleasure to turn the event over to this morning's moderator, Professor Patricia Fabian. Professor Fabian is a professor in the Department of Environmental Health at our school, associate director with the Boston University Institute for Global Sustainability, and also affiliated with the Hariri Institute for Computing and a graduate program in urban biogeoscience and environmental health. Her scholarship and teaching focuses on health and environmental health disparities in the built environment. She built the first systems model linking housing, indoor air quality, energy use, and health, and as I mentioned earlier, was instrumental in shaping today's event. Professor Fabian, thank you, over to you. Welcome everyone, good morning. Nice to see uh, people in person and welcome to everybody online as well. And thank you, Dean Galea, for the nice introduction. Um, it's my pleasure to be moderating this panel today. Uh, planning better cities, how do we build a healthy city of the future? A quick note, quick note on logistics before we start. We're going to have our panelists give uh, short presentations first and then once they're done, uh, we'll invite them to come up to the, to the um, uh, stage and have a panel discussion. Uh, we'll have questions from the audience in person. Just raise your hand and someone will bring over a microphone uh, so you can ask your question. And then same online. You can post your uh, question in the chat and we'll be taking questions there as well. I'm going to uh, jump straight in and introduce our first uh, speaker, Dr. Melissa Chinchilla. Dr. Chinchilla is a researcher at the VA Los Angeles HSR&D Center for Innovation, the Center for the Study of Healthcare Innovation Implementation and Policy, and an associate investigator with the B VA Rehabilitation Center and Development Center on Enhancing Community Integration for Homeless Veterans. Dr. Chinchilla's research focuses on the social determinants of health with an emphasis on housing and homelessness. Dr. Chinchilla. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, where are we? Okay. So I'm going to start off by giving a brief overview about why homelessness is a health issue, which is one of the things that I was asked to speak about. And then I'm also going to offer some thoughts on the possible future of, of housing in cities. And I'll add that in addition to my work around veteran homelessness, a big focus of my work in the last couple of years has also been around racial ethnic disparities in homelessness with a specific focus on Latino homelessness, uh, which I'll be talking a bit about today. So to start, you know, homelessness is one of the most pressing policy issues of our time. In 2020, there were over half a million people that were identified as experiencing homelessness in our national counts. And if we look at long-term progress on the issue, it's been fairly modest. So we began collecting this data in 2007, and since then, in looking at the 2020 count, we've only seen the number decrease by about 10%. And there's recognition that homelessness disproportionately impacts communities of color. So black and indigenous people are disproportionately represented among those that are houseless. And you know, this, 
This disproportionality is no doubt a byproduct of systemic inequality and the lingering effects of racism, which continue to perpetuate disparities today. And I'm sure many of you have seen this graphic before. Um, homelessness is a health issue. We know that the social determinants of health, so where people live, work, and play, have a greater impact on health outcomes than our healthcare system does, which only makes up about 20% of what goes into our health. Homelessness is significantly associated with chronic disease, unfavorable clinical events, and premature mortality. We estimate that nearly 40% of individuals that are homeless have a chronic health problem. And homelessness has also been associated with um, high rates of emergency department use, and patients experiencing homelessness are about five times more likely to be admitted into inpatient care than non-homeless persons and also have longer average length of stays. And we know that homelessness is very expensive. So research suggests that the cost of public services average close to 100,000 per person per year experiencing homelessness, um, with about 50% of these costs being attributed to healthcare costs. And in contrast, we know that housing placement for individuals experiencing homelessness reduces healthcare expenditures. We know that it increases primary care use and all overall health outcomes for this population. When people ask me, well, you know, why do we see so many people experiencing homelessness? I really like to emphasize that at the root of homelessness is access to affordable housing. And growing income inequality has really fueled the crisis. So the middle class is disappearing, and since, 27, since sorry, sorry, 1970, the gap between the richest and the poorest in our society has only continued to grow. People across the nation are also increasingly rent burdened and are, are unable to afford housing. So cost burdened renters spend more than 30% of their incomes on rent and utilities each month. And in 2020, the share of burdened renters reached 46% nationally. And as I mentioned, the last several years, part of my work has focused on raising awareness about how the Latino community experiences homelessness. And this year, while homelessness increased only about 6% in Los Angeles County, it increased 26% for Latinos. And this is a pattern that we're seeing across, nation, uh, across cities in the nation, including San Francisco, seeing a high increase. And as the number of people experiencing homelessness has continued to rise, we also know that uh, in a large part, the homeless counts underestimate the need. Homeless counts are often one point in time and include people that either can be seen through unsheltered counts or that are formally connected to the homeless service system. So those would be included in sheltered counts. And even before this year's rise in numbers, for years the Latino community was more likely to live in substandard, overcrowded, and doubled up housing. People are taking turns sleeping when you have a sometimes 12 people to a one bedroom unit. We have folks creating beds and kitchens and hallways because there's no space to sleep. We also, don't, we also have folks that don't always have access to facilities such as kitchens where they can cook or at times even have to go um, to restrooms that are outside of their unit. And these folks are not being captured in our homeless count numbers. So if we only use homeless counts to understand how large the problem really is, we're missing folks that are extremely rent burdened and underhoused, living in substandard conditions. And as I've been doing this work in the past few years, one of the questions that I've been asking folks to consider is how do we, as a, uh, one of the richest nations in the world, understand and conceptualize housing need as a society? How do we define homelessness, and what do we believe it means to be fully housed? So for example, if you're not a leaseholder and you have no tenant rights, are you fully housed? If you don't have access to a kitchen where you can cook healthy meals, are you fully housed? If you're taking turns sleeping because your living environment is too crowded for everyone to rest at the same time, are you fully housed? As we think about how we address homelessness and also the resources that it takes to meet the community's needs, I think it's critical that we expand our understanding of the issue so that we're better able to gauge what resources are actually needed to solve the crisis. 
Um, more and more we see that the resources that are allocated to address homelessness are not enough. And part of this issue, I believe, is because of how we're assessing the, the problem at hand. And I believe that health is undoubtedly intertwined with how we fight for and frame the importance of housing affordability. And this was made ever more clear by COVID-19 that showed the health risks of overcrowded housing and also highlighted the difficulty of accessing care when one is unhoused. And our healthcare system is changing, though maybe a little bit slower than some of us would hope. Um, we're starting to see a shift towards managed care under the Affordable Care Act, and under this, healthcare providers are increasingly paying attention to the social determinants of health. And the majority of them are now working to identify patients' needs and also linking them to community-based resources. However, there's much more that needs to be done, because even if you're able to identify the needs and then hope to link folks, what if the resources aren't available in the communities that folks are being referred to? Um, specifically, I think the healthcare system will need to start considering how they're actually investing in communities, how they're contributed to, contributing to limited housing resources, and also really supporting advocacy efforts to empower local communities to advocate for themselves. And I'll close by saying that health is a critical reason why housing matters. And if we think about health as a fundamental right, then we can also begin to think about housing as a right. And we have a long way to go, um, but I think that it is important to note that under the current presidency, we have seen mention of housing as a right in America, which at least is the first time I've seen this in, um, in, in a public discussion. And conversations are now beginning to at least start, the, we're beginning to at least start conversations on affordable housing and housing subsidies being a universal right. Um, there's so much more work that needs to be done, but I look forward to questions and conversation on this topic. Thank you, Dr. Chinchilla. Um, we will now hear from Dr. Barbara Ferrer. Yes. Um, Dr. Ferrer is a nationally recognized public health leader with over 40 years experience as a public health director, educational leader, researcher, philanthropic strategist, and community advocate. Currently, as director of the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health, which prevents disease and promotes health equity and well-being among more than 10 million county residents. Dr. Ferrer in that role oversees a budget of over 1.8 billion, directs a workforce of nearly 6,000 staff, and works to integrate services with the county mental health and health services departments. She guides the region's COVID-19 pandemic response in collaboration with county and community-based partners. Um, and you may have seen her a lot in the news because she is the public face of the LA uh, department. So. Oh, great. Um, good, good, good morning, and thank you so much uh, for having me here. I'm, of course, thrilled to be back. Many of you know I spent about 35 years in Boston. I actually graduated uh, from the School of Public Health here, from this wonderful university, and did a doctoral program between BU and Brandeis. So, uh, so I, I appreciate the students who are joining us both here and virtually as well. I, I think you're at one of the premier uh, places in the world. Um, to get grounded in an education about how you can go forward and really ensure that everyone uh, has resources, opportunities, and power uh, that's needed for optimal health and well-being. And I want a special thanks to Dr. Galea and to Dr. Fabian uh, for having me here. Your leadership here has been instrumental uh, to, I think, preparing uh, future generations of public health practitioners. And I'm also really honored to be here with the esteemed panelists uh, that I'm going to be joining with uh, in a minute. Um, if I do this right. There. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really um, going to start just sort of talking more globally about what we might have learned from this pandemic, um, starting with the fact that f for cities to thrive, uh, they've got to address some issues that have been with us for decades, although certainly the last three years during the pandemic, uh, they've been made uh, apparent, not just uh, to a small group of people, but I think to uh, millions of people uh, across this country and across the world. 
Um, I want to start with the issue related to disproportionality. And um, I, I want to start with this because um, we saw a lot of disproportionality. I'm going to show some data on this in a second. Uh, but you cannot have thriving cities um, if you unfairly allocate the resources that people need uh, to be healthy. And, and that's what we continue to see uh, in the way we organize our cities, the policies, the systems, the practices. Uh, they all need to uh, be realigned. Um, we've also neglected worker safety, and I'm going to show some data on that, which I think is fundamental to a justice-oriented agenda. Um, and, and occupational health and safety gets left out of our discussions uh, way too many times. Um, I think we've all learned it, it's, uh, it's not just that public health isn't funded, it's that we're not, it's not understood what, uh, what our purpose is. And if you understand what our purpose is, it's not sufficient to think about just funding public health departments. So we've got some big challenges around how we think about public health. Um, and then I think uh, we've all been living with, and, and all of you here, I, I don't need to talk too much about this because I think you are acutely aware of the fact that we have policies and practices all over the place that make it hard to get the kind of information that we need to better understand the world that we're living in. And more importantly, uh, to get information in a way um, that's easily accessible to the people who give us the information. So it's not, the information doesn't belong to the researchers or the academics or the public health departments. The researcher belongs, the research and the data we're collecting belongs to the people who live and work in our communities. And, and we still have so few technological tools, so few resources that are dedicated to that issue of, it's more than transparency, it's really uh, sharing uh, in that sort of joint understanding to uh, figure out what's going on. Um, I wanna just, uh, uh, you know, sort of for each of these uh, issues and challenges I've identified, I wanna just share a little bit of data or some examples. Um, this is the all-cause mortality rate uh, for LA County. This picture does not look different uh, for any other, for most other cities that are diverse. Um, and it, it goes over a 10 year period, 2011 to 2021. You can see that that green line at the top is the experience on all cause mortality for black residents. Uh, the blue line is the experience for white residents. Uh, the red line is the experience for Latinx residents. And the orange line at the bottom is the experience for Asian residents. So one thing to note is um, huge, huge, huge differences um, that have historically uh, put black African-American residents in LA County uh, with higher rates of, of death than everybody else. But if you look at towards the end, what you'll see is during COVID, everybody's mortality went up, it was a big deal. I mean, we all read lots of uh, research that was done that, that tried to explain the increase. Uh, but what we didn't see a lot of is sort of the fact that um, black and Latinx residents actually had the steepest increase for the first time uh, in more than a decade. Um, Latinx residents now have a higher rate of all-cause mortality um, than uh, white residents. And most of this is attributed uh, to what went on during COVID. Um, and, and I just, uh, to emphasize sort of what we, what, what's be, beyond, behind the sort of all-cause mortality, this is a look at specific death rates uh, for some common uh, illnesses and diseases. And you can see that for black residents, pretty much with the exception of COVID, where Latinos and Latinas actually have the highest death rate, uh, consistently a pattern of uh, inequity uh, in health outcomes. And many of you are already know that as we think about these inequities, uh, it's not helpful uh, to focus on personal behaviors. It's much more helpful to think about systems of care um, and systems uh, that organize resources. Um, and I, I'm gonna try to drive this home a little bit with just some, some data looking at uh, what was going on during COVID. Lots of people see that the mortality rates are higher for Latinos and Latinas and for black residents and assume it is directly tied uh, to the fact that we keep hearing that they have lower uptake 
of life-saving vaccines. And for sure, you can look at this data. This is uh, looking recently. This is recent data, not during a surge, at hospitalization rates by race and ethnicity and vaccination status. And you'll see, without a question, the vaccines uh, save lives um, and help people from getting uh, severely ill. But what you'll also notice is that vaccines are not an equalizer. Um, so just getting vaccinated did not change the fact that both blacks and La black and Latinx residents still had higher rates of uh, hospitalizations. Um, and, and if you uh, look at this, you'll also note that the same uh, holds true if you look at this by poverty. Now, poverty in L.A. County um, is highly correlated with the color of someone's skin. So most of our communities that have high rates of poverty are, in fact, communities uh, where black and brown residents are living. But here you can see just how stark uh, some of these differences are, uh, particularly if you look at um, both the experience, not just of vaccinated people, where, again, the vaccines provide everyone with more protection, but not the same level of protection. Um, as a matter of fact, people in the wealthiest communities uh, who are um, unvaccinated uh, actually um, have a um, lower rate of hospitalization than people who live in communities with high rates of poverty who are fully vaccinated. So again, I want to note where you live has a huge impact on other contributing factors to health, and we saw that during COVID. So the solution to uh, the inequities is not so simple as we needed to get more people of color vaccinated. That just would not have necessarily closed this gap. And, and the same thing, you could see the tragedy around deaths as well. Um, sometimes people sort of look at this and they wonder, well, if it's not something as simple as access to vaccines or even access to therapeutics, which is why I try to use more recent data when we do have therapeutics and we have access. And in LA County, we have, for both of those, we have a really good access. Um, I, I would say that one of the biggest issues uh, that contributes to the inequities we're seeing is both the historical context, people living in overcrowded situations in highly dense neighborhoods, uh, that's where low-income uh, people live in L.A. County and I think in many other cities. But I also want to say that exposure was a big deal uh, in explaining uh, sort of what we were seeing. Um, the folks who, and you could see this clearly here, this is what we call an outbreak map. This is where we responded to outbreaks, three or more EpiLink cases uh, at a site. Everything's reportable to the Department of Public Health. Uh, and you can see that um, over time, um, there were some sectors where we just had high rates of outbreaks. Uh, where you see those big peaks, those are all our surges. Uh, but you can see here that um, restaurants, food processing plants, factories, retail, hotels, and transit, those workers were much more likely than everybody else to get infected. Those are also the workers that didn't get to stay home, uh, that work. I mean, I went into factories uh, where we had outbreaks and the conditions are horrible um, and the protective measures for workers are almost non-existent. Um, they're overcrowded. There's almost uh, no real air quality, especially if air conditioning is broken and windows don't open. Um, and people are in close contact with lots of other people all day long. And those people who are in close contact with lots of other people all day long then go home to communities that are very dense and to housing that's overcrowded. And you got massive, massive spread. Um, and, and that's what we saw. And that's actually what we continue to see. Every time we have a surge in LA County, the disproportionality grows between black and Latinx people and white and Asian people. That gap just gets bigger. Every time we're not in surge and there's less exposures for everyone, the gap narrows. Uh, and we need to pay attention to that, not just because we're talking about COVID, but because that issue of exposures, whether it's exposures to oil and gas, 
um, that, you know, uh, refineries and oil wells that are right next to people's neighborhoods and schools, or it's exposures to bad air, or it's exposures to lead in the soil and lead in people's houses. Exposures really matter in terms of uh, the inequities we end up seeing in health outcomes. I also wanted to talk a little bit about sort of the public health funding. Um, I put this up, this is sort of our funding uh, for the year we're in, um, not to talk about the fact that we actually have a fair amount of funding, uh, but to talk about the fact that almost all of our funding, over 80% of it, is tied to grants and obligations uh, for a set of particular services. It means it's not flexible. It's not flexible during a pandemic, so when you need to find quarantine and isolation housing, you're really scrambling to figure out where that's gonna come from. It's not, it wasn't flexible enough to help us deal with making sure we could figure out how to get food to people. It doesn't pay for homebound services to get folks vaccinated. It's all very directed. And it's, uh, we're told what we need to spend it on and we're told what those outcomes need to be. And those outcomes are usually very specific. They're not about improving the health of people whose health outcomes are the worst health outcomes uh, you have in your communities. They're very specific to whatever the funding source. Um, and we need to pay attention to that because um, it, in order for a public health system to work, you have to both invest in infrastructure and you have to allow for a fair amount of flexibility. Um, and when we talk about infrastructure, and this is something I, I would never have really uh, been able to articulate as much as I can now because I didn't really have this deep of an understanding pre-pandemic. Our CBOs, our community-based organizations, our faith-based organizations, they're the backbone also. They're the backbone of public health response and have always been. All of these are pictures of community activities, communities that helped us mobilized to get vaccines into areas where we don't have clinics, uh, we don't have healthcare providers. Uh, we had folks that go door to door, our promotoras, our community health workers, uh, giving people information, uh, talking to people, uh, trying to answer their questions, trying to connect people, not just to vaccines and or therapeutics, but also to food. Um, so, uh, the last couple of things I wanted to just mention, because I know I'm running out of time, is um, we also have to pay attention to fractured trust, um, because this will defeat us uh, as we try to move forward and build thriving communities if government is always, or always continues to be seen as a non-trustworthy uh, partner. Um, and you, we saw the ugliest examples of this uh, throughout the pandemic, but I think we've experienced this before. Uh, and the way to deal with fractured trust is to acknowledge that there's a good reason why there's fractured trust. Uh, many of the communities that don't trust us are communities where they frankly feel like, feel like and have been ripped off by government, where we haven't paid attention to their basic needs and we haven't been supportive. And we go in with solutions that have no bearing on the problems and the challenges that people and communities face. So we have a lot of work to do here and we all have to own this. We created this problem of fractured trust. It's being magnified with social media, misinformation, the politics of the time. But fractured trust was something that we've had for a long time and just didn't pay a lot of attention to it. And I'm gonna close by just um, noting that um, I, I am not uh, feeling hopeless. <laughs> I feel like the picture you know, I paint is one of big problems, uh, but we're a country where we've had big problems before and we're very capable of uh, coming up with appropriate strategies for addressing big problems. Uh, but we do have to organize. Uh, we do have to make sure that we build out a public health infrastructure by investing in community-based organizations, faith-based organizations. Uh, we do have to partner with labor uh, and workers, uh, we have to deal with, I mean, this has always been a place where public health has had a long history of improving uh, the conditions for workers and those conditions, when they improve, change health outcomes. Um, if we look back in our history, you see that for every single big improvement in health outcomes, we were paying attention to workers. Uh, we're gonna need to also uh, deal with, uh, different, deal differently uh, with issues around sharing information. 
Um, we got to create a two-way path to have information in real time. And lastly, of course, um, we've got to partner with others on the sort of addressing root cause issues. We've got to deal with racism, oppression, um, all of the, the um, isms that really stand between us and uh, allowing us to create cities where everyone's going to thrive. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ferrer. Um, he's here. Meredith. Great. Okay. Um, now we will hear from Dr. from Mr. Arthur Jemison, who is the Chief of Planning at the Boston Planning and Development Agency and also serves as the director. He oversees the agency's core missions of community engaged planning, regulation of major real estate development, management of the BPDA's real estate property and workforce training programs. Mr. Jemison is a creative public private development leader with over 28 years of planning and affordable housing expertise working with community members to create equitable places in Detroit, Washington, D.C., and Boston. Prior to joining the city of Boston, Mr. Jemison served as Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. Mr. Jemison. Hi, good, uh, good morning. Uh, it's great to see you and great to be, uh, great to be here. Also, obviously, great to see um, uh, Barbara Ferrer, a uh, former leader uh, that I got to serve with uh, during my prior service with the city. Um, so it's, uh, it's exciting to be here and talk a little bit about a few key topics. Um, probably wondering, why is there a planner here at the meeting about public health and resiliency? Um, I can certainly say that um, when I was working at City of Detroit, um, you know, during the uh, outbreak of the pandemic, uh, and I was working to identify um, non-congregate shelter for all the people uh, who were in the city, uh, along with the leader of the housing and departments and the state uh, agencies involved, I felt very much like I was in the public, um, I was in the public health business then. Uh, and as I had a chance to work at HUD, I would also reflect that uh, I found that out that I was also working in public health then, not just because of the homeless response, but also because of the uh, work that uh, my section of the agency did on the matter of um, disaster recovery and the work we were doing with uh, communities on disaster recovery. So at any rate, I want to walk through a few slides with you, um, but the, the basic uh, elements are, uh, i got three points to talk about today. One is uh, blight, decadence, and substandard housing. Those are the three things that the BPDA was chartered to attack. Uh, our goal to have 800,000 people um, reside in the city uh, in 2050. Um, and um, uh, the partnership we need with the development industry um, around uh, the, the key issues um, of resilience, affordability, and equity in order for us to, to make progress. I'll try to specifically highlight uh, the ways that resilience are critical to that. First, I want to give you a little primer on uh, what's special and unique about uh, Boston and the Boston Planning and Development Agency. Um, <clears throat> so our post-World War II story like many American cities, um, it does include uh, some decline and disinvestment and importantly, a flight from the city primarily by, uh, by, by the white families and population. Our population was at its peak um, in modern history of 800,000 in 1950, uh, and it went down to 500,000 by 1980. Um, our recent history is more one of resurgence, but to, be to understand a little bit more about the agency that we've got, uh, and the way that resilience is part of it, uh, we have to go back to 1957. Um, at that time, um, the Commonwealth and the city uh, joined together to form, basically charter a new public agency, the Boston Redevelopment Authority, whose job was to attack blight, decadence, and substandard housing, and implement what were deemed to be modern um, planning techniques and approaches. Um, you know, Boston and the, and the state sort of charted it together. Uh, I would say that for those who don't know what those techniques at that time were, you know, Ed Logue was, um, was different than uh, Robert Moses and others, but many of the approaches to parkways, highways, um, clearance of substandard housing and replacement by uh, with international style housing development was really the core uh, of, what they, uh, of what they were, were, were advancing. Uh, the city at that time was desperate for private investment. Uh, everywhere from the Globe to uh, other newspapers said that we were uh, a backwater and were unable to sort of uh, foster development. Um, the sort of 
uh, nadir of this trend was the clearance of the West End, uh, which has been seen sort of historically as one of the most egregious examples of using urban renewal powers um, to advance, again, removal of blight, uh, decadence, and, and substandard housing, but also um, a major mistake taking a mixed income, um, multi generational, uh, multi racial neighborhood in the city uh, and, and wiping it out. So, uh, following the, uh, the, the elimination of that neighborhood, Scully Square, the New York Streets neighborhoods, and a few other places, um, the pushback on the redevelopment agency was relentless, and it resulted in um, a, a, really, a real redirection of that agency's work, um, along with, uh, I've covered some of these topics, I'm sorry, I gotta catch up. Um, so you'll have to see some of the um, more egregious examples and photos of clearance uh, that exist here. Um, this is a little bit of the taste of the, uh, of the pushback uh, that resulted in much more affordable housing, public parks, schools, and other municipal services. So to, on those foundations, the city has become the modern city that it is. Uh, the same charter of having the agency work uh, carefully to drive development forward um, while absorbing the lessons of these um, early ventures in, uh, in <coughs> urban renewal and redevelopment. Um, it's really the, the basis of, of why the city is, is in, has the strength that it does, and, and not just in uh, the downtown, but increasingly uh, in neighborhoods. Um, I think the key thing to focus on and where resilience comes in, and this is a picture of uh, Mayor Wu uh, on Morrissey Boulevard, um, is that the charge of the agency in 1957 and 1960 was to make us a competitive place again um, and to drive forward development, uh, going after those three things, blight, decadence, and substandard housing. If you had to say what the next 60 years of growth and development are really gonna be gated and bounded by, you would probably focus on different things. Uh, for our city, in the particular circumstance we're in now, uh, we believe those things are uh, resilience, affordability, and equity. Those are the things that really are gonna create boundaries for us uh, in the way that we grow. Um, the, the threat to, to the city that I think you read about most has to do with housing and the affordability of housing and, our, and the inability of us to compete against other places with lower cost housing, but similar, uh, similar kinds of uh, knowledge industries. Uh, take, for example, uh, the uh, Research Triangle area in North Carolina, uh, places like that. Um, so if we're going to actually um, grow, we've got to find a way to, uh, to make peace with these three, uh, with, with those three things. We have to find a way to have our charter to advance affordability, uh, equity, and resilience. Those are the ways we're gonna do it. So the, the threat to, threats of housing sort of also um, has a sort of more important threat behind it. If we can't have housing affordable in our community, the workforce that drives every aspect of this city forward uh, isn't going to reside here. They're going to choose one of the other places. So um, the approach we're taking to, um, to get these things uh, is to focus on how do we uh, attract and then maintain a population of 800,000 people. Uh, this goal allows us to sort of uh, indicate how acting to develop resilience, acting to develop affordability, and acting um, to create equity um, are the ways that we're going to get and attract those 800,000 people. Um, since the city hasn't been 800,000 people really since the, in the post-civil rights era, and so the, what it's going to take to actually create that environment uh, is uh, really making our sort of social contract and our development agenda the same. Uh, it means that we're gonna need to focus on where there's development possibility that is near the water's edge. Uh, we've got to prioritize um, ways to protect uh, those investments and make sure that the growth uh, is going to be here for past 2070 and further and that's built for uh, an adapted uh, coastline that we're going to have to have to be protected. We're also going to have to make sure that as we are building those 800,000 uh, building to accommodate and support the 800,000 people that we're growing in a way that creates affordability. Uh, and again, not just uh, conventional affordability in the sense of uh, income restricted units, but enough supply that's reliably being generated to make sure uh, that we have a supply of housing. And finally, uh, in terms of creating equity, uh, we gotta find ways to create value that, um, that drive, uh, create value for people so that 
every participant in our city that's been growing is able to um, is able to benefit from that uh, investment. So we don't do this work alone. We're the private sector. We're the public sector. We need the private sector to help us to achieve these goals. Um, so what we're going to be doing, and these slides sort of give you a, a little bit of a sense of some of the uh, issues that we're going to be addressing that I spoke to a few moments ago. Um, the Mattapan project is a, is a great example of a place where we're focusing on equity uh, and the development of um, accessory dwelling units, for example. Um, again, I'll just get, finish up through, going through these slides quickly um, and just end here because I know my time is probably coming to an end. Um, we need a new relationship with our development industry if we're going to be successful at doing this. Uh, and what that means is, um, is recognizing that while the challenges in front of the city require more capital to be addressed, um, we, we have the resources among us to provide that capital. Um, in exchange for providing that capital through things like uh, some of the programs and policies the city already has, we need to make it easier to do business and easier to do business the right way. We need to make it very clear what we mean by resilience and, and the kind of investments we'll be expecting to do that. We need to make it very clear what we mean uh, and, and speed the plow for any project that's able to meet any of those three thresholds. So uh, with that, I would only add one other thing, which is I know uh, I'm here at a university for a reason. Um, if it, We need the best minds in the public sector. Uh, if you're interested in change, um, the public sector is one of the places it happens and one of the places that when it happens, uh, we can drive uh, the private sector uh, to do great things as well. So as you are thinking about, uh, the people who are listening, thinking about what they want to do next, please consider us at the BPDA. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Jemison. Next, we will hear from Ms. Mary Rowe, a leading urban advocate and civil society trailblazer who has worked in cities and with communities across Canada and United States. Ms. Rowe is the president and CEO of the Canadian Urban Institute, which under her leadership has expanded its work to include an international network from government, industry, community, and city building professions to advance research and collaborate on solutions to some of our greatest urban challenges. Ms. Rowe. Hi, I'm just delighted to be here. I'm a, I usually call myself a PK. My father is a, was a, a priest, but, um, but he was also an academic or a dean, so I guess I could be a DK. Uh, and when I was in the dean's residence last night, I spoke to the dean and said, oh, I remember these kinds of parties where the house had to all of a sudden be made ready and the kids were told, don't be going into the part of the house because you know, mom and dad are having a party. So um, very nice to be part of an academic gathering, though, I've got to say. A really lovely opportunity for me to hear from you and to learn all the different things that you're um, uh, struggling with, but also how unbelievably resonant it all is. I feel like we're all having the same conversation in different contexts with different aspects, but it's really all the same conversation, which is about the relationship between place and people and how we actually maximize and optimize for both, for the place and for the people. And I... Um, uh, I said to the guys at the desk there, I read that booklet, the report, the 2021 report that, sh that you put out uh, in bed last night and was just struck again by how remarkable a difference individuals can make. And I just want to echo my colleagues' comments about the nobleness of the public health mandate of a public health school. In, we're all public, we should all be about public health. And whenever I go into any city and look at any situation around urban life, I always look to see what is the public health department doing? Because all the great urban innovation that we have historically generally has come from a public health practitioner of some kind. And so to make this more general, and for us to understand that actually we're all in this business of promoting public health, that back to that people place connection, um, is uh, really valuable for me to be reminded of and for me to just witness it in your presence. So I'll blow through some slides really quickly, but I also just want to say that in Canada, where I live in Toronto, I'm, I'm a dual citizen and I was in a number of American cities and Andre Perry and I are old colleagues from New Orleans. In Canada, we always start meetings by doing an, an, a land acknowledgement and where we talk about the ancestral territory that we occupy. So I'll just do that for you in, our, in terms of where we are in Toronto, which is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Wendat, the Chippewa, and the Anishinaabek. And we have, Toronto is, is a very, very multiculturally diverse city, but it also is the ancestral home for Inuit, Métis, and, and First Nations peoples. And part of what 
we have to come to terms with as urbanists and what Arthur just reinforced is that historically urban planning has been extraordinarily exclusionary and has in fact reinforced systemic barriers and racialized practices and all the things that American cities are very clear on and at least we're clear that they exist. I don't know if we're as clear as we need to be about how we dismantle them and how we're perpetuating them. And in Canadian cities, which are younger, we have our own, ver well, younger in terms of settlers, we have our own versions of this. So I feel like we always have to just check ourselves in terms of what the reality is in terms of our ancestral histories, but in terms of our current practice as well. So um, not dissimilar to Barbara's comments about what are we gonna learn, uh, I have started to talk in Canada about what's the COVID dividend. We had a lot of things that we had to rapidly do, and we were able to do them to make life more livable, to protect people, to support people. And as we hit, believe it or not, December 7 is COVID-1000. And as we hit that, are we going to think carefully about, um, boy, it's a very lovely reveal there, <laughs> how quickly that takes. We, we started, are we gonna be able to harvest the best of what we did well and get it to stick? as opposed to reverting. And actually, we were having a conversation over breakfast about how um, the tendency you know, to regress to the mean is even worse, that we're kind of gonna swing back to the way it was, whatever normal was. And we will miss the opportunity to have the kind of seminal change that we know we need to do. So at CUI, we started, believe it or not, we started writing reports at COVID-100 and then COVID-200 and COVID-300. And then we did one at 365 days of COVID. We were using the WHO declaration date. And at 365, we were exhausted and thought we were done. We just all thought, I mean, didn't we all think that? We all thought we'd lock down for two months and then life would go back. When we were at the year mark, we started to see the same kinds of patterns that you've already identified. That there was, that all the things that were dysfunctional in urban environments were just exacerbated, made worse, made much more visible by where COVID was actually manifesting and where the risks were the greatest. So we've decided to m take this December date on the 7th and mark COVID-1000 and ask ourselves, what are the COVID dividends? So one of the things that we did through COVID was we put up a participatory crowdsourcing platform called CityShare where we asked people just to put some stuff down that's working well in your community. We have over a thousand entries there of community-based responses, mutual aid, delivery services, different ways of offering public uh, uh, supports, all the different ways at the ground level of how people improvised. And what we're finding now, which I, my colleagues are all reinforcing, is that we have some really fundamental choices to make about the future of urban life and future of cities. And the challenges aren't new in many cases, but they were made much more visible. So for us in Canada, for instance, one of the great challenges, obviously, is the economic impact that our downtowns and our main streets are, have been virtually abandoned. We've had the, Canada had some of the jurisdictions with some of the longest lockdowns, and so that has meant the work from home pattern for people that could, or the other kinds of challenges that were on essential workers and essential services, the people aren't using those services. So our transit systems in Canada operating much, much lower. That means it has a significant impact on the fiscal health of the municipality that depends on transit revenue. I can see Arthur nodding his head. Um, it's had enormous impacts on independent businesses. I'm very interested, Barbara, during the panel, we can talk about factories, but also mom and pop businesses, as we used to call them, often run by immigrants or newcomers on main streets. Work in Canada, they were propped up for a period of time. There were wage subsidy programs and rental relief programs. All of that has expired now. And so when you are, if you're in a downtown or if you're on a main street in any of Canada's major cities, it's worse in certain ones than others, you will see boarded up shops. You will see signs that people can't get staff. And of course we have dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of empty office floors, dozens. So for us, the Canadian GDP is largely generated from the urban environments. To try to make that case in a country that is organized historically, not dissimilar to the United States, with a kind of representation around geography, which means that the, there is no urban real political power. It's, it is dispersed so that you can have a local Canadian a member of parliament that represents 60,000 people and you can have another one that's representing six and a half million. It's tipped away from urban and we have, a, we have a narrative in Canada that isn't particularly urban. So it's really interesting to see how we can actually tip solution finding to focus on where we have congregate 
environments where people are living together, working together in denser environments. And from the climate's perspective, that has to be the future. But we have, we have to run against a political grain that isn't that. So this piece about the, the call the dividend for me is this, and we were just talking a little bit about that. We've had seminal moments in urban life historically, and it was often your constituency, public health, that stepped in and said, wait a second, this led to that crisis. Out of it, we're gonna, find, we're gonna manage wastewater differently. We're gonna manage building codes differently. Um, or we're gonna do uh, uh, coastal protection differently. So that, for me, is the question we all have to sort of focus on. Of all these things, and you know, some of them are trivial. And, you know, there was a lot of pushback in, in Canadian cities about patios and bike lanes, and basically it was just accommodating white people. But I think there are more fundamental things that were that, that were broader benefits to broader populations that we need to find how do we make them actually stick. So which of these measures that were ad hoc that we were suddenly able to do that everyone told us we could never do, which should stick? What are the lasting ones we need to do now? What is the future of density? What's the future of co-location? What's the future of transit-oriented development? What's the future of affordable housing? What's the future of land use? Where's placemaking fit in all of this? How are we gonna actually summon a kind of collective wisdom to make, in our case, at CUI, we focused on main streets and downtowns, where are faith institutions, where are our, our social uh, mutual aid uh, organizations, where is digital media, where are libraries, all the things that help us bind and create connective tissue. How do we invest in them, and how do we leverage it to create the cities we want? So we're trying to build a very broad alliance in Canada, industry, private sector, labor, civic, civil society, academia, all the different constituents that, con constituencies that actually care about a city. A city is not just the local government, it's all of us. How do you actually put them together in as broad a kind of constituency you can, but still have an action focus? So we've got four areas of concern, as I suggested, all of which challenged considerably. Rebuilding downtowns and main streets, mental health and homeless, I'm done. Uh, infrastructure, transit, and climate action, and then uh, how do you actually drive development from the base up? So our goal is this, to see if we can actually position Canadian cities as leaders in urban sustainability, and I feel like that is the collective challenge that we've got this moment. I saw the mayor's comment, can we meet the Boston moment? I think we have a global moment for cities. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Rowe, and I hope to pick up some of the topics. It's you know so easy and so um, to go over. There's a lot of things to talk about. We can talk in the panel. Um, I'm pleased to introduce our final speaker, Dr. Jota Samper, assistant professor at the University of Colorado Boulder. His work concentrates on sustainable urban growth and dwells at the intersection between urban informality and urban violent conflict. He obtained his BA in architecture in UNAL in Medellin, a master in city planning from MIT, and a PhD on urban and regional planning, also from MIT, where he was a lecturer for the past two years. Dr. Saber. Thank you, Dr. Fabian. Thank you, Dean, uh, for, for the intervention, to, to the invitation here. I'm very excited. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of different context so from what we're seeing today. Um, my work concentrates on informal settlements or what some people call uh, slums uh, that I define as self-built neighborhoods outside of city regulations in conditions of extreme poverty. Uh, the UN uh, tend to define these places as places that uh, lack uh, important services like water, uh, overcrowding, et cetera, et cetera, uh, the structural integrity of houses. Uh, so what I want to do, talk today is about these kind of three ideas. Uh, you know what? One of them is, uh, is about how, how broad this issue is, how big it is. Uh, why uh, one of the most important issues is that uh, a lot of the presentations today have uh, benefit from uh, the wonderful time that we're living right now. There is an abundance of data. And actually, uh, this issue that you're going to see that is a little bit large, uh, has the contrary effect that we have actually very little knowledge about that. There is a little uh, accounting of it. And then I'm going to end sort of with a proposition about how informal settlements are places for innovation. Uh, and this is just to talk about a little bit of the scale, to three moments in time, and it's shocking, talking the entire, showing the entire uh, complexity of cities. So 
uh, three different moments in time. And basically what it tries to say is that informal settlements are becoming the most in predominant uh, form of urbanization of the planet. You know, by the year 2050, uh, three billion people will be living in informal settlements. Uh, it will be, that will be half of the cities of the planet. Uh, what, what, you know, make this the most common form of urbanization of the planet? Uh, but the paradox is that's actually the one that we know the least, you know, because uh, a lot of the places where informality exists uh, don't have the resources to actually map uh, or to get data about these places. And sometimes even the institutions and governments uh, that have uh, the resources to do so uh, cannot do it because uh, it's impeded by their own regulations uh, to map uh, populations that live uh, illegally uh, within the boundaries of their countries or cities. Uh, so to try to deal with this issue, uh, I invented uh, with a, a group of collaborators uh, what I call the Atlas of Informality, that it tries to bridge that gap uh, between understanding uh, the scale uh, of the issue, try to map it globally, uh, but also to understand one of the most important uh, features of, uh, of, the, of this particular urban form, and is the, the condition that is always changing. It's an urban form that is always in flux. Uh, and so uh, we did, uh, with aerial photographs and, and direct mapping, uh, created this catalog uh, that is continuously growing that maps neighborhoods and look at these neighborhoods over time and how they are actually behaving and, and changing as uh, a result of that. So we've, what we found was something very interesting or something quite expected is that they were growing uh, uh, as, you know, the data is sort of suggesting uh, constantly. And so, and uh, more importantly, we find this, uh, this issue that the entire sample uh, is growing at an at a, at a incredible rate, you know, the 9.85% uh, uh, of growth annually. Um, so just to put that in, into, into context, uh, uh, it, that is uh, 2,300 square kilometers a year. Uh, so you see that the little dot over there is uh, Central Park, just to give you an idea of the scale. So this means that every year, uh, out of the expansion of existing settlements, uh, w one of the largest cities in the planet is created. So uh, larger than, than Moscow or uh, Houston or Tokyo. Uh, is created every year out of the expansion of existing settlements. Uh, and so this shows a little bit of uh, that kind of discrepancy between uh, what we found with our research, a little bit of what the UN is trying to say, uh, and that is seen actually a, a, a down uh, proportion of informal settlements uh, growing. And so I think it's a very important understanding of, of, of looking and, and creating this type of data. So one example that I wanted to show here is a, is a project that we did uh, trying to look about climate change and what the impacts of climate change is going to do to these particular places. So we're looking at the specific neighborhoods or across, across the entire world and, and trying to map how those neighborhoods actually were that are the ones with the less resources, uh, located in the environmentally more sensible areas, uh, the ones with the st structures are less prepared uh, for resilient mechanisms, uh, with lack of uh, any kind of uh, urban infrastructure, uh, are, we're going to cope uh, with those issues. And so we find you know, uh, horrible places uh, that uh, neighborhoods uh, that are going to experience, like uh, Kaguri, uh, that is going to experience 77 more days uh, over 90 degrees. Uh, in a place where you know uh, roofs are made of tin of of tin um, of metal, uh, that are actually going to experience uh, 90 more days a year, uh, or uh, 77 more days over over 90 degrees. So, creating this data is important to understand uh, you know the resiliency of of those communities. Uh, but. Uh, one element that I wanted to uh, bring here, and it's sort of like when I, I switch the, uh, the kind of perspective upon informal settlements, is that uh, these are not only spaces of lacking, uh, but they're also places uh, for extreme uh, innovation. And so it's kind of a proposition that I'm, that I'm trying to generate here uh, about this idea that uh, uh, in, informal communities, by living in conditions of scarcity, uh, need to be extremely inventive uh, with the few resources that they have. And so for that, I, I just have this kind of uh, 
uh, phony example. You know, this is the United States with 5% of the planet that spends 25% of the ener energetic resources of the planet. Uh, this is China that has 20% of the population of the planet uh, that spends the other uh, 25%. And we know that China is trying to you know, create parity with the West. Uh, what it will mean at some time China will uh, you know, consume all, all the resources of the planet. We'll need another planet just for the United States and the rest of the other countries. Uh, but this happens. Uh, and it's because of this, because we are, we are trying to uh, emulate models uh, from the past century, and it's this famous Le Corbusier hand over his uh, three million inhabitants model. And on, on the left, uh, you are seeing uh, these uh, Chinese cities emerging between uh, uh, Shanghai and, and Beijing on the, on the train line. And what we're seeing is these models, uh, modern models of urbanization, uh, and the way that all, all our cities here in the United States are, are being designed, uh, are, uh, are the models that are really destroying the planet. Uh, and so, and what I suggest is actually uh, the informal communities have this ability to adopt transformative technologies more quickly uh, than, uh, than us. And, and by doing so, actually uh, have the ability to, uh, uh, to help us uh, to search for new ideas. And so uh, the, the cell phone is one ex excellent example of how you know, uh, countries developed countries uh, were able to reach parity of uh, uh, telephone connectivity uh, with the entire planet. So we say places like Ni Nigeria, for example, that has the same uh, coverage that the United States, just by adopting uh, that new technology. Uh, and so, and there are all these new products uh, and projects emerging uh, to be applied in informal and poor places around the world. Uh, so, for example, the Metro Cable, that is, uh, is this uh, transportation system in Medellin, Colombia, used all, uh, specifically for uh, resolving problems of transportation for informal communities, are ways uh, that uh, show how we could think in, in uh, infrastructure uh, less impactful uh, kind of interventions uh, to, the betterment, to the betterment of city. And so my proposition is this, is that this one third of the planet by living in a scarcity and uh, adopting uh, new models of innovation are actually uh, uh, opening the opportunity uh, to discover uh, new forms uh, that could actually help this, uh, uh, the, the rest of our cities in, in, in the developed world. And so one, one example, final example that I wanted to present is that, is that we have, um, looking at these informal communities, they have created projects that we have adopted right now that are very transformative. And so these two examples I, that uh, are, are, quite, are quite interesting is, is for example, the motor taxis there, this, tax, this motor, that you, motorcycle that you use to transport somebody else and you use as a resource. That is this idea that you use your own vehicle as a way to generate larger levels of income and, and fulfill this kind of social uh, transportation system. It was invented in informal settlements you know, uh, more than 50 years ago and then it's sort of the model that is applied by the, you know, the ride apps that we're using. Uh, and, and this idea that uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, with, with, the, with the sharing economy uh, of that uh, we use our own asset as a way to generate income uh, is the way that actually uh, uh, units in informal settlements are self-financed. You know, like this radical idea that instead of getting a loan uh, to pay for your home, is your home the place that actually pays for the place that you live in? And that was invented in informal settlements almost 100 years ago. Uh, and, and so uh, my uh, interest is that there's all these kind of inventions uh, in the spaces of informality. Uh, there's all these kind of businesses and strategies that have been implemented uh, for decades already uh, that could be quite transformative uh, to the way uh, that we think about the planet. So uh, the final thing that I wanted to do is that uh, we need to make these communities more visible. They are part of our cities and and, and, and they deserve to be, to be accounted. Uh, and, and that uh, we need to pay more attention to that creativity that happened in these places, uh, uh, not, not only for, for those, uh, but because we also need finally to apply that creativity into our cities that really need to be safe. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sampred. And uh, maybe can we have a round for all our panelists for really, really interesting um, presentations. I'm now going to invite all our panelists to come up on the stage so we can have a panel discussion. We're running a little bit behind on time, so we will be taking questions from the audience, but maybe having a little more conversation with panelists first. So.
So again, thank you everyone for some wonderful talks. Um, I'm going to start with what I think was a common theme among everybody and I think the theme of the symposium and that's opportunity around building uh, city resilience and then innovation along different things. So I heard innovation around uh, identifying vulnerable populations that we haven't thought of before and that the pandemic brought to light. Innovation around creating a non-traditional partnerships among community organizations, industry, public sector, private sector, um, and innovation around uh, economic, the economics of it and how we're going to fund it. Um, so can I maybe have each of you talk about, you know, pick one of those things because you each talked about innovation among all these different um, categories and just talk about how that's happening in your world. So maybe Mr. Uh, Jemison could just start with you around creative partnerships for, for example, affordable housing or anything else. I guess what I would say, since we're resilience talking today, uh, I mean, I, I learned and absorbed so much from my fellow speakers here about different approaches to uh, some of the topics, uh, particularly the, the last couple of um, presentations. Um, I would say I d it's very difficult to sort of talk about what the innovations are yet. I guess what I'd say is the urgency of identifying them and how essential they are to what we're doing is unfortunately kind of the stage we we're at, um, you know, I would say um, for me, I had a chance to work at the federal level for about, you know, 18 months um, in the Biden administration and, and talking with, you know, part of my job was to be the person who was the acting assistant secretary. So I got to talk to a lot of mayors who were, had had disasters about things that they would do with the money when they got it. And so um, I hear a lot about the innovations that sort of come from scarcity uh, as was being described, and I, I think there's there's a lot there, um, but I would say that even more than the volume of individual solutions, um, there the idea that this is something that we have to adapt to now, and we have to start spending our community development assets as if they're designed to protect us from, um, or as if they're designed to adapt. Um, that's actually something that just in the 28 years I've been working is like. The learning and absorption of that as an imperative is really like the last three or four years. Really, it became a, a matter of real urgency, not just in the, um, the sort of more progressive corners of the city, but er of, uh, of the country, but everywhere. So um, I guess I, I look at, um, I was enjoying some of the discussions from Canada and the discussions about public health responses and, and the fact that people are the the real resilient resource and, and then the, the elements about um, uh, that we were talking about with the um, with the informal settlement. So I would just say it's, for me, it's, it's less about the individual strategies, but the imperative of identifying them and then bringing them to scale. That to me, that's the, the, the newest part. I was with you. Whoop. Am I on? Oh, yeah. oh no, I'm on. Um, I was with you until you said get to scale. I always get anxious when people start talking about get to scale. Um, I think we, we need to make room for innovation. And I think my observation at 63 years old is this. Here's my wisdom offering. When times are good, we make a lot of rules. And when things go sideways and all hell breaks loose, we then get really creative. And that's when the real innovation happens. It, it was in your book, somebody talks, one of the, somebody in, the, in one of those books is talking about creative destruction. And so what I think we have to do is always default to the local. The best solutions are being incubated locally. None of our countries is organized to, to privilege local, but we've got to try to find a way to do that, which may mean resisting the temptation to do too many rules. If you keep the pilots and the experiments local, you minimize risk and you'll make some mistakes, but you minimize the risk. And then you use that time, just as we saw in Medellin, they solved the access to Communa 13 locally, came up with that brilliant cable car system. And I, when you say scale, what I worry about is that we are, we, it's an industrial model mm -hmm. that somehow we've got to take it once and then do it 55,000 times again and again. And I feel it's fundamentally anti-innovation, just saying. So, I love that answer. And I, I'm not, I only want to just maybe boost up a part of it and just sure. say, um, I only think about scale because I worry about um, I worry about adoption. And one of the things that's tough about uh, climate change is that you're only as strong as your weakest mm -hmm. place. And so, I only the reason I worry about scale because you were 100% right about local innovations being the place. 
um, is that if we don't do it quickly and have roadmaps to do it quickly, um, our maybe our adaptations in Massachusetts and New York might be great, but the fact that they didn't do it in Pennsylvania means right. that like something terrible happens. That's my only yeah, thing. Yeah, but yeah, I think you're very on the money. Yeah, I, I you know I, I appreciate both both perspectives. I think I, and I think they they offer us a lot of insight. Um, I, I'd raise a couple of other issues, though, related to innovation. Um, I totally agree, you know, at the local levels where uh, you're, there's, A, there's more flexibility, but always, you know, problem solving happens best if the people experiencing the challenges are given the power and the resources to not just innovate, but to get policy change. So I think where I worry is we've got a lot of examples of really smart people in our communities doing amazing work. Uh, but they, they're, not, they're not funded, they're not supported, uh, the practices aren't elevated, um, and they're not sustainable. Um, so, so that's one concern I have is that if we're not organizing uh, to redistribute power, to really deal with decision making, uh, the innovation, as powerful as it is, um, doesn't necessarily um, allow for transformative change to continue to happen and to, con and to benefit um, the people who are trying their very best um, to actually figure things out. So I think it, I think it can work, but I, I think it would be great if we figured out how to better resource it. And I would say the second issue I would raise is probably, it's probably more troubling to hear this, but I have a problem with the word resilience. Um, and, and some of you, I think, know that I have this problem. Uh, because oftentimes um, resilience gets used to justify oppression or marginalization. Um, like we should, you know, we should make sure our kids are resilient so when bad things happen to them, they're not, you know, devastated by them. And I think our job really is to have less bad things happening. Um, and, um, and that's why I call it thriving cities, because really what we want to do is we want to eliminate um, sort of these sources of bad things. And we don't want to get sidetracked by saying, you know, how are we going to get people to buck up? How are we going to get our cities to buck up to the bad things that may happen in the future? I feel like we've got to stop allowing for so many bad things to happen. And that's collectively organized again. Um, so that bad things don't happen so much. So that we're in front of, you know, it's, it, there's some inevitability that I think gets used with the word resilience. I, and I think it's more, it's more difficult when we talk about resilient people than we talk about resilient communities. But I think you, we need to be careful not to blur that. Um, because really what we want to do is uh, build our capacity um, for, again, for, for optimal well-being. Um, and that means addressing the, the sort of the sources of oppression, the source, the racism. Uh, the things that really stand in the way of making progress and not um, putting all of our resources into the resiliency basket. So I, I think that, you know, we obviously do need to be able to withstand sort of the unknown, but I think we need to do so uh, again by acknowledging um, that some of the things that keep happening over and over and over, particularly around disproportionality, uh, we need to fundamentally address. Well, that's that's wonderful. Uh, even the the way you are talking about uh, resilience, that I, I wonder a lot about that in in the spaces of informality, and 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 so that I always uh, try to walk this very difficult line between, you know, uh, my proposition that was we need to learn from informal settlements, and that the, we are romanticizing, you know, the suffering of a billion people or more. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so that's always like a very uh, difficult uh, thing to do. But I think um, in my case, so like I, I, the innovation uh, actually comes from understanding that we are formulating our definitions and problems wrongly. And so the way, for example, the UN uh, looks, and, and, not, and the UN is all, uh, I'm, not, I'm not talking bad about the UN, but the way the UN uh, defines what informal settlement is and how it develops the strategies to deal with the issue is actually the problem that has hide uh, with that our ability to see the innovation in these places. So when we see an informal settlement as a place of lacking 
everything that we have in, in other cities or in other places of the city. Uh, it doesn't allow us to see you know, the richness of the other opportunities of resilience that are actually happening there. And so I think that happens with a lot of our problems in our cities, is that we are framing, framing them in a traditional model or modernist way, I will say, uh, that doesn't allow us to see what are the innovations that could happen when we reframe the problem in a different way. Yeah. So that's, in my case, that's why I always start talking about that informal settlements are self-built neighborhoods, talking, giving back the agency of place making uh, to the people who live in these places instead of a places of lacking of. Thank you. Thank you. Um, no, thank you so much for your comment, Barbara. I really appreciate the reframing of, of the term. Um, so in you know the last couple of years, I, since 2018, I started doing work on Latino homelessness. And the reason was because in Los Angeles County between 2016 and, and 2017, the number increased drastically. Um, you know, the, and I just started wondering, well, what, what, where is this conversation at? And I started digging it a little bit deeper and realizing that not a lot of research had been done specifically on Latino homelessness. And instead, what had been talked about had been the Latino paradox, which was um, kind of similar to Latino health paradox, the Latino housing paradox being that um, when it comes to homelessness, that Latinos are underrepresented in people experiencing homelessness because they tend to rely more heavily on social supports instead of entering the homeless service system. And so not a lot had been written or has been written even now because there's this idea of, oh, well, they're, they're okay. They're, they're relying on others. They, they're not um, entering the homeless service system. But as I started trying to better understand what was happening, I realized that they weren't entering the, the service system because there are a lot of challenges and obstacles to receiving services. So this idea around the community being really resilient was actually, it was a, this false construct of, you know, actually their resilience was based on an inability to access resources that they were entitled to. And so I started doing more work in this area. Um, and recently we saw a huge increase in Latino homelessness. And now more folks are starting to pay attention to the issue because the numbers are showing up in these official counts, which I would say are not the most accurate to begin with. Um, but now there's more attention being paid to the issue. And, you know, I, I, for me, as I was doing this work, I was thinking, well, anyone could have seen that this was going to happen. Anyone that knew anything about the housing situation of um, some of the densest communities of the Latino community and that had a sense of how COVID impacted this population would have known that this was going to happen. So, you know, the, the Latino community and, and, and issues of housing instability had been framed around this discussion of that they're resilient community and that they're not being impacted in the same way, but it was kind of a um, question of, well, what, what is the actual question that we're asking here? And how are we digging deeper into the um, um, circumstances that we're seeing? But I just wanted to provide a, a little bit of background in that. I think in terms of the homeless services space, which is where my, my work is focused on, there's a couple of, of things that have emerged in the last couple of years that I think are, are interesting. So there is a bigger push of including the voice of people with lived experience. So to, to Barbara's point, and in, including folks that are on the ground and ha are experiencing some of our systems, there has been a greater emphasis on that. I think it's low in coming, but people are definitely talking about it and there's a push around um, including voices of, of people with lived experience. The other thing that I've seen happen more so is a reframing of how we think about racial ethnic disparities to using um, a frame called targeted universalism, which was is something that's been proposed by, by Dr. Powell. Um, and he is, it's really thinking about the way that we measure success and how we think about disparities and, and reframing our goals, right? So instead of comparing one population across the other, we're saying as a society, this is our goal. Our goal is 30 days to housing after someone's identified as experiencing homelessness on the street and then looking across populations to see if they're meeting the, these goals. And if not, making um, providing targeted interventions in order to make sure that they're meeting these goals. And then in, in terms of, I, I know a lot of the, the um, folks on the panel talked a bit big about ideas around uh, resilience and how we build resilience for cities. I wanna give a, just a quick example of something that happened in California. So with under COVID, through COVID-19, we saw a lot of resources coming down the pipeline. And one of the things that we saw was the use of uh, motels, hotels in order to house people that were experiencing homelessness. So usually we think of shelters, we think of congregate settings. There are a lot of challenges to congregate settings. People don't like to 
be in congregate settings to begin with. And so we saw that there was a, a push to utilize hotels that had been empty because of COVID-19 to utilize these as temporary housing for people experiencing homelessness. And this is something that Los Angeles City has continued to talk about. Like how can we, um, if there are vacancies at hotels, how can we use these to house people temporarily and work in collaboration with some of these institutions in order to make that happen? Dr. Fabian, can I just, I, I, wanna, I, I wanna just give a, maybe just sort of build off, because I think that was sort of a brilliant example of, of being innovative. Uh, but I wanna note that one of the reasons, particularly in the Latino community, why we saw such a significant rise during COVID was a lot of people got super sick. Most of them were essential workers. And we don't have paid sick leave. So let's just be honest, like the fix is not necessarily to take over hotels. That is a good solution for an immediate emergency. But how can we as a country in this day and age not have paid sick leave for everyone, yep. for our day laborers, for the mm -hmm. housekeepers? I mean, all these folks had no recourse. They got sick, they had, to, they had to stay out from work, and they had no money, and they were living on the margins to start with. Um, so I think that's why I say, like, we got to be innovative, but we cannot be successful if we don't take a hard look at the policies that continue to perpetuate uh, what's wrong. Yeah. Um, so, it, you know, so I, I mean, and nobody, you know, we didn't move. Like, we've had three years of a pandemic, and we do not have paid sick leave. Yeah. Like it just seems impossible to me that, and, and I know in Canada no, no, you no, do. So. No, we don't actually. We have, we, okay. We're not that virtuous. Oh, okay. I mean, we have the similar. Because I was just challenges. going to say, like, it's. I mean, it's it's been a fundamental issue in health. You know, sort of promoting good health has yeah. been allowed. I mean, especially around infectious diseases, people need to not come to work when they're sick. I, I think we need a bit of a hierarchy around these. You know, these attributes because I think you can't to hell with innovation if you don't have justice. Mm -hmm. And I think that we've got to, you know, there's a, a fetish that's been out there for some time with innovation, but in fact, if you don't have a fundamental grounding around human rights, around uh, entitlements, and that exists even in a country that would be seen to have more socialized um, uh, public supports, we had the same issues with uh, uh, sick leave. And it, and it ripples through the system because it's, it ripples right through, even to, the, even to the people that don't do have sick leave and don't choose to take it, because they think, well, they'll just go into work. You know, yeah. it's crazy. No, yeah. Can I, can I just add a comment about informality? I feel like during COVID, we were all compelled into a, a kind of, I used to say, we're in the DIY moment. Every neighborhood is DIY now. And it sings to the, it speaks to, it's, it does sing to the success of informality that we can improvise and do all sorts of interesting things. And then it's government's job to figure out how it takes what works and then norm it up and create the right infrastructure and the resources, as you're suggesting, so that you can have more of it. We should be taking more of it and doing more informal. So, sorry. So I was just going to respond to that. We, we did a, a work during COVID looking at informal settlements because what we anticipated was if these are the communities living in the most rich places with high levels of density uh, of people that actually depend from the street, uh, this will be, of course, the most affected communities around the world. So we look at Latin America and we're mapping what was happening and how informal communities were responding. Our surprise was that for them was actually just, it was just the crisis of the day. Yes, exactly. So they yeah. activated networks that, that didn't yeah. have before. Uh, they found new ways of, 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 col of collecting, uh, uh, supporting each other. Uh, we saw that a lot of creativity within those communities to actually uh, deal with the pandemic. And they didn't fare uh, significantly worse than their counterparts uh, in more informal places of, of, their, of, their, uh, of their cities. So that was a surprise uh, for us that shows it talks about that flexibility and how to bring that flexibility back to cities is a really important part of it. Can I make a quick comment to Barbara's point? Because I completely agree. I think that's, you know, it's not the shelters aren't the solution. These midterm um, things, they, are, they aren't the solution in the long run. And it is about fair wages. It is about affordable housing. It is about these like bigger issues at hand. I think. Um, one thing that I, I will say though from like a student perspective, sometimes it could feel really overwhelming to get to the point where we do have these bigger policy wins. And so I think it is, I, I, 
Yeah. <laughs> I always like to emphasize that change happens in, in phases at times and that there's like smaller wins where we're working within the system and then hopefully like there's bigger wins as well where we yeah. transform the system. Um, so I just wanted to, to make that comment because I, I think as, you know, students sometimes can become a little <laughs> disillusioned at times. So and we're buying hotels and motels, so I don't want to, I'm yeah. totally in favor of that because we're actually putting a lot of county dollars to buying hotels and motels so that we've got flexibility for housing. Particularly for us, we need this housing for isolation and quarantine. So this is a good segue to a second topic I wanted to talk about, which was funding and whether you had examples of sort of creative ways of funding cross-sector collaborations to solve some of these problems. Um, in your own experience, and whether this uh, Inflation Reduction Act funds that provides funds that are pretty flexible for community engaged projects, and if you've seen any application of those funds and creative ways that we can scale up to the rest of the world. I'm just going to speak as the Canadian because I'm off the, I'm off the island on this this particular specific topic. But just to, just a warning. You remember Jane Jacobs in Death and Life of Great American Cities talks about cataclysmic money. And, and, you know, calls out a cautionary tale about what happens when the wall of money comes. I think that we need to be really thoughtful about how, what the increment of money looks like and how it can be broken into to negotiable small pieces. Because our government of Canada, obviously a tenth the size of yours, but still very big increments. And in fact, when you were mentioning in your presentation, it's actually community-based organizations and not-for-profits and different kinds of innovative approaches, and they're quite small. A number of you work for them, and you need smaller grants, not the federal government, uh, you know, nine and a half million dollar type grants, but something in a much smaller increment, which is a segue to you about how local government should be the administrator for that kind of uh, experimental support. Uh, uh, what I was going to say was similar, but the it, it's really astonishing how much money um, could be allocated to local units of government very quickly. I mean, I think if there's one thing I noticed was even under the uh, prior presidential administration, there was a moment where just billions of dollars suddenly arrived yeah. and were available to my city. At that time was Detroit, which had very, didn't have anything like the kind of money that was being given. Now, there was a crisis, um, and the crisis had to be mitigated, but it was, uh, in some respects, cataclysmic money. We've had two second waves of that money. And I think actually, in the administration of that money, the real, the rubber is meeting the road kind of now, actually, in the sense that maybe the first things you allocated the money to initially have been tried. Maybe some of them have been successful, other ones haven't. You're dealing with remnant you know, parcels and, and remnant pieces of um, capital maybe hasn't been expended in the way you, you initially anticipated. Um, so a lot of the innovation is happening now, but I definitely think that the moment where we said, well, we actually do trust communities to actually spend the money the way they think they should spend it, and then we do trust them to, it happened. And I think examining what's going on now is going to be very valuable because there's so many um, crisis uses of these funds, whether it's the initial coronavirus relief funds or it's the subsequent, um, you know, PPP or like just all these initials we had never seen together are now in our hands, and what do we do with them? Uh, it's, it's going to be pretty interesting to see. I, I think, I mean, I can give a couple of examples, and, and again, it's, it's not with the new money because we don't actually have the new money yet. So, but with, with sort of the, the relief money for coronavirus, um, one of the things we were able to do is fund what we call worker centers. Um, this is, uh, really to make sure workers had good information about uh, how to protect themselves and what, we had issued a lot of health officer orders really governing what could happen in a workplace, kind of overstepping what historically might be your authority as a health department, but using it nonetheless because we had a declared emergency. But we, we wanted these, these worker councils because, and centers because it was an opportunity for um, non-unionized workers to get together, talk to each other, and organize. I mean, it, you know, like at the end of the day, I mean, it, it's, not, it's not on us to really dictate uh, how those worker councils work, but it is an opportunity to fund an activity that allows workers to come together, uh, learn together, and then advocate 
um, uh, with, you know, in their places of work for the kinds of conditions that support worker safety and worker health. Um, and we've managed to sort of continue to find other money because, um, you know, COVID money dried up, but to find other resources uh, that can support that effort. Um, because again, that's an effort that's very local. I, you know, each of the worker councils, we have tons of them. They each are doing their own thing. But I think, again, it's an opportunity to allow the people who are working in the places where we really saw, you know, we picked the, the sectors, the work sectors that were the hardest hit. Um, and all of those, for the most part, had a lot of uh, non, non unionized labor um, so that they could, you know, both get good information, but also tackle the problems and the issues that they were facing and that they wanted to prioritize. Um, and I think there are probably lots of other opportunities to, again, think about how this money goes to those in our, our nonprofit partners. We, we have a huge contracting issue, as most government aid, you know, departments do. We create these intermediaries so we can dump $20 million to an intermediary that then can very quickly, without all of the red tape that government has, try to you know, get that money out to the smaller organizations that are the backbone of response in a particular community. So I think we've learned from, you know, to, to sort of really you know, be innovative about and try to work outside the constraints that usually make it very difficult for government to, even local government, um, to turn quickly, to pivot, to, you know, unless we can be creative and think about other opportunities for the money to get, uh, again, closer to the people that are doing the work or experiencing the challenge. So I think we are out of time. So I want to thank our panelists for really important remarks and invite the audience to continue the conversation over lunch. Uh, which is in the back. And I'll invite Dean Galea to give some closing remarks. I actually have no closing remarks. Okay. Then lunch. Then lunch. We'll reconvene okay. in 25 minutes. Okay. Sure. Great. Thank you. Thank you.